I just have to take a picture of you guys really quickly. <laughs> Hold on. So everybody smile. We're going pano here. Yeah. This is my first time to Oxford, so I have to remember it. Oh, yes, on the end. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm sure thank you so much for coming. Oh my gosh, um, so it's a pleasure. So as usual, um, we'll start off with I'll ask a few questions of my own before opening up to the audience um, for some of your questions. Yeah. Um, so if I may, I would like to start at the beginning. Um, <laughs> how did you know that you wanted to get involved with acting? Great question. Well, I knew I wanted to get involved with acting when I was at uni. Um, I went to Boston University. And I went there initially to study opera, actually, voice performance. And um, while I was there, it's a classical program, a classical university within, a classical college, excuse me, with um, conservatory within the university. And so while I was there, I was studying music theory and music history alongside of movement and Shakespeare and acting. And in the morning, I would have these movement classes and we'd be rolling around on the floor and Shakespeare classes. And then in the afternoon, I would be, you know, studying the history of Rachmaninoff or something. And I started thinking, I was like, I think I really like the rolling around on the floor part more. <laughs> and that was really when I started to experience the bug of acting and it started to really come alive with me. And then I started doing some productions as well at college. And I realized in that moment, when I moved to New York after graduation, I think this might be the avenue I most strongly am drawn towards. And that proved to be so. And, and when you were kind of looking at that shift, <laughs> who were your biggest influences in terms of where you drew your inspiration from? You know, that's funny because I actually, not all of my inspirations are necessarily actors. Um, even though I'm pursuing acting and I'm doing acting now, some of my greatest influences, though not titled actors, their level of performance, or I think the depth of their art, or the passion from which they spoke, or delivered, or wrote, is where my, my inspirations and um, um, became my heroes. And I think those people are range from La Divina, Leontine Price, who is a world famous legendary opera singer, um, to the artist Basquiat, um, just the visceral nature of his painting, Picasso the same, um, with a simplicity, simple ferocity is always what I think I've been most drawn to. Um, from the acting realm, I've always been in love, of course, with Meryl Streep, I think she's phenomenal. I've been a Dame Judi Dench, who is also phenomenal every time. Um, that's probably uh, Dustin Hoffman. I've loved Cicely Tyson. Um, and do these people have the simple ferocity you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, they have a simple ferocity, or there's a stoicism, I think, in their work, and um, a thought behind it. I think they're not afraid, really, to either boil or simmer and you're not really ever sure which one you're seeing. Um, something, sometimes when you watch someone boiling, it's actually not their highest point. So, you know, I think that sometimes when you, when you watch that sort of, the shape of that, the arc of that, when they reach what might be a high, it's actually been something very well contained for most of the story or most of the song or most of the play, whatever it is that they're, medium of expression is, um, that's what's exciting to me. It's not, it doesn't start on level 10 right from the beginning. There's always something behind that reason that has purpose. And I think all of those artists that I just named have always been that for me. And um, <coughs> I think it's fair to say that the road from kind of graduating from college to where you are now is not, was not a simple or easy one. No. Um, and, and you've spoken several times before about how you were very close to giving up. Um, how did you keep on going in those moments? You know, 
there have been, I mean, before I got Orange is the New Black, I had given up. That was actually the very first time in my life where I had 100% committed myself to crossing over to the other side of something. I think previous to that, there had been, you know, um, stops in the road where I had debated, considered, thought about, but never had fully committed to quitting. Previous to actually quitting, I think it was honestly the support that I had around me of starting first with my mother, um, who has been a champion of mine my entire life and easily the greatest example I've ever had to look to for what, what can be produced out of hard work of what can be produced out of that. Um, and that's just the sheer commitment and the focus and the discipline of applying yourself towards something. Um, my family, for those of you that don't know, my family, I'm from Nigeria. Nigeria in the building? Yes! No way! <laughs> really? We're coming back to that. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah, see? I know, yes. Nigeria, that makes me so happy. And I'm gonna take it back home. Um, yeah, you know, my family's from Nigeria, and my mom and my family had come to this country um, post um, the Afrin Civil War. And really with only one dream, my mom's dream, she said my entire life really was for myself and my siblings. My parents wanted, their American dream was for us to be able to live our own dream. That was really kind of the simple base for it. And what I got my entire life, the greatest lesson that I was ever given was that through hard work, anything can be accomplished. My mom always saying, I don't know, I've never heard of nothing coming from hard work. Eh? There's no such thing. There just doesn't exist. We know that. It's a fact um, that was laid into me day in, day out, by example. So I carried that with me to New York. And that would be the, the same champion, the same cheerleader I would call when I was experiencing any doubt. And she was excellent at picking me up, reminding me that it was my duty to myself as, a, as an artist and as someone who had said that this was my passion to stay the course. Um, on the day that I did quit, I didn't call her, maybe I should have, and um, <clears throat> I hadn't ever quit before anything really in my life until that day. And the challenge that I was facing felt mighty and overwhelming at the time, but, come, but when I got the job of Orange is the New Black on that day by some prophet, you know, and fortune, what I got out of that really is that, and I hope all of you amazing young minds who are maybe beginning this first leg of life on your own or about to step out into the real world, real world of you know, maybe caring for yourself or your own professional endeavors for the first time, I would like to encourage you to believe that despite whatever roadblocks might be facing you, despite whatever immediate challenges you feel you've met, despite whatever hardships you might believe you've come from, that if you have a passion, if you have a fire that has been stoked and set inside of you, it is your responsibility to keep that fire burning and to stay the course. And that is what I got out of that day, more than anything, that if I have a belief of some kind inside myself, it is my responsibility to see it through. And in the last three or so years, you know, where your star has risen so, so <coughs> rapidly, um, with the success of Orange is the New Black, um, how have you found your performances in projects aside from Orange is the New Black change? Um, you know, because you are so synonymous with the character of Suzanne Warren. I mean, how have your, how's your performance process has changed in other projects? I think it mainly has changed just in terms of the scope. You know, um, I don't ever want to give the false impression that I had met, like, Orange was my very first job in my life. I was like, yes, this is my first technique. No, I had worked prior to that, but I think the 
level of work that I have since been involved with has significantly changed. I think also I've been very grateful that from the experience of Orange, which knocking, you guys say tap wood, we say knock wood, knock on wood, may it you know, be this way. I have been very grateful that because of the, the, from the platform of Orange, creators, you know, of all sorts have been willing to take a chance on me in varying degrees. Um, and not necessarily roles that are, you know, identical to that of Suzanne Crazy Eyes Warren, you know? <laughs> not all of those roles are that way. And I've been very grateful, you know, my second um, job that I got to step into immediately, or most publicly, I should say, was a, um, was a musical, televised musical of The Wiz. I don't know if that came on over here or not, but um, where I was able to play Galinda the Good Witch, and I'm forever grateful to our producers, Craig Zayden and Neil Marin, who produced the piece, and our director, Kenny Leon, for having watched Orange, I had been familiar with my work on the stage in New York, and really took that chance with me. And I think that's what I think most actors are excited by when they step into certain roles, or maybe more iconic roles, is that the opportunity doesn't necessarily lead or invite more of the same thing, but provides the opportunity for people to see a piece of your body of work, or what it is that you do as an actor, and give you the opportunity to do something else. And we just saw it there, as a quick aside, just saw it there. you don't like to call Suzanne crazy eyes. I don't call her crazy eyes. She's not crazy to me. She's not, she's not crazy to me. Everything she does makes sense to me, or else I would be <laughs> you know, I have to justify it. So. Does that mean she's not crazy or that you are? One of the two. Ah, <laughs> to be discussed off camera. No, um, I think, I, I think um, no, I don't think, I, Tim, for me, Suzanne is mis, grossly misunderstood from the perspective, because, well, from just from the acting standpoint, if I, give an opinion that is counter to her reason, then I'm now in judgment of her, right? So my exercise of the role is more commentary than actually living it. She, in her mind, you know, and this is like a more dramatic example, right? When somebody takes another person's life, they have explained it to themselves, the reason why that is okay. I'm not saying it is okay, but they have justified it to themselves, right? And I think on a lesser degree with regards to Suzanne and her actions and things that she says, whether it's throwing pie or peeing on the floor, or, you know, saying I will cut you bitch. Like, you know, she has a reason why she has said and or, you know, reciting Shakespeare, she has a reason why she has chosen that road, right? And so for me, when I'm doing the work of working through those scenes, I have to explain those reasons and come up with the honest place from which that choice came from. Because for her, it was entirely justified. How it was received, I have no control over, but what, the why, I can explain. And in terms of being a a uh, you know, character in the ensemble cast of Orange is the New Black. Yeah. Uh, how did you prepare for that role in, you know, in terms of visiting women's federal prisons or reading Piper Kerman's book? I mean, what happened for you? I did read the book. <clears throat> I read the book. I thought that was just useful because, because I knew it was um, adapted from a true story. I wanted to know what the true life Piper Kerman's journey was and what she really came out with from that, from that experience, you know, in terms of her knowledge and just that's a very clear, easy insight into the world that is, or is the Litchfield, a fake prison. Um, and then I also used to be very strangely, you guys, obsessed with this show on America called Lock Up Raw or Lock Up Abroad in the United States that we had. It was like a docu-series about prison. I used to watch it all the time. I was obsessed. So I used to start watching it on YouTube again. Um, but for me, in terms of the discoveries for Suzanne and who Suzanne is, when her character was introduced in the second episode, the writer of that episode, Marco Ramirez, he had 
um, this really beautiful and exciting stage direction for her, description for her. And it described her as being in part um, like innocent like a child, except children aren't scary. <laughs> and I thought that was such a beautiful key into who this woman is. Because I thought it, number one, I thought it informed who she is just right off the bat in terms of how things about her actions can immediately be misunderstood or misinterpreted in some way. Because children, for example, if we had a toy chest here, right? and you bring a two-year-old in here, they're gonna start tearing through it and this room is gonna be a mess in two seconds, right? The intention of that child was not to make it a mess. The intention of that child was to get to the ball at the bottom of the trunk. The mess is still there, but the place from which it comes is different. The intention is entirely different. So that to me just informed this woman might make messes that might be seen by others in ways she doesn't entirely intend them to be seen. Um, so that was the place when I realized, oh, she's in love with this girl or trying to woo this woman, you know, her dandelion in that season. <laughs> I said, oh, this is, this is actually a love story. This isn't someone trying to be scary. This isn't any of that. She is really, her intention is simply to woo. She really is just trying to get this woman to understand how deeply she, she would care for her. And from that, that just changed the lens from which I saw that name of Crazy Eyes. I said, oh, she's not crazy. She is misunderstood. Um, and that was probably the brightest light on how to sort of navigate through her story. Mm. And <clears throat> you can kind of see it in how you're talking about the character and you know, the funny anecdotes, etc. The, the, the funny way in which you describe it. There is a double emphasis both with Orange is the New Black and indeed with Suzanne between the dramatic and the comedic. Yeah. Uh, and you know, congratulations, of course, because you were recognized, uh, you, you awarded uh, an Emmy in both the drama category and the comedy category. Thank you. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, but how do you find that, how do you strike that balance between the comedy and the drama? Mm. You know, I, I am of the personal opinion. I don't know a great drama that I've enjoyed that did not possess some areas of levity and vice versa. I think when you really, and that's what I think is really actually the beauty of the show that Genji has written. She understands that balance very, very well. That's our show creator, Genji Kohan, Kohane, excuse me. She enjoys, she knows how to strike that balance very, very well and understands, I think, the importance of that balance for really penetrating into the core of what it is, whatever it is she's trying to say, whether it's on our show or with Weeds, her show previous. She's a genius and a master at that. And I'm in support of that. You know, when I think of even, you know, great plays that I've loved, whether it's, I don't know, Hamlet and the fool scene, you know, the, that, the act, the play within a play, you know, that's in a moment where you get to see something. Shakespeare doing this amazing thing of, dramatizing in a sort of silly way what's already occurring in the world of Denmark, you know. I think that's exciting when you see those moments happen, or the play I'm doing right now. Um, I'm doing a play over at Trivaldo Studios um, in the West End, Jean Genet's um, The Maids, and Genet has injected many moments for the audience to take a breath, because if you don't give them that breath, it just becomes a little bit too much or almost can feel sometimes a bit heavy handed. And so when I'm working on the piece of Orange is the New Black, I try to find, sometimes I think this line could just be read pretty straight, you know, in a dramatic context, but wouldn't it be interesting if we kind of took it another way and found some bounce in that or maybe made this thing in another way? Um, that's interesting to me as an actor to experience. I hope it's interesting to audiences to experience, um, but it certainly it provides more texture, I think, for, for, and shape for the arc of the story. And in the year that separated your award for uh, the comedy, uh, the comedic actor, and then for dramatic actor, yeah. um, did you notice, were you 
aware of the fact that Suzanne was perhaps you know funny one year and then more dramatic the next year or I mean how, how did that happen no you know I mean that's I mean just I have to circle back again I think that's reflective of the story that Genji is interested in telling in that season I don't I really do not believe she aims towards the category that the show is you know or that she's really thinking you know this year we're going to be really dramatic I think she has and her team of writers as well you know they spend however many months figuring out the shape of the season and what they do beautifully is they have these hills and valleys hills and valleys and whatever character serves the greater story that we're telling is what she works towards and if it so happened if it so happens that this year Suzanne has maybe more funny things to do than the year previous, then so be it. Um, I don't think there's, from either the creative end or the actor end, is there any aim towards, you know, the, we're not playing towards the joke and we're also not playing towards the tears, if that makes sense. Mm. No, most certainly. Um, and you just spoke about it there when you talk about the shape of the season, um, you know, the various seasons of Orange is the New Black and the hills and valleys. But obviously the big difference between a Netflix show and other TV shows is that, um, be it to their own detriment uh, or, or anyone else's, people just binge watch Netflix, yes. Netflix shows. I'm currently binge watching House of Cards, just so we're clear about <laughs> it. I was watching it in the car on the way over, <laughs> just so we're clear. So I, just, I will be doing it when I get home, go on. And, <laughs> um, yeah, House of Cards is a popular one around here. Oh, um, so and is, is that a difference that you're aware of, you know, when producing the show? Does it come into the performance tool? Does it come into the shape of the story? That people are just going to sit there for 12 hours and just watch it all? It doesn't come into it for us as the actors. We do not, or I, I, no, I will even speak for the group. I know that we do not think about it. When we're on set, we have the great fortune of coming to tell our, to do our show sort of in a vacuum. Um, our show is not, you know, 22 episodes long where the first 10 episodes are shot and put in the can and then premiere on television and now you're shooting the back 12 while the first 10 are airing, right? So you're conscious of any conversation. Our show is shot pretty much like a movie, you know, a 13 hour movie. We shoot all of it. That's why it takes so long to come out, you know, until we shoot all 13. It takes you know, anywhere between six and eight months of post um, for it to then be put together, because it all comes out at the same time, all 13 need to be finished, right? So it takes about six to eight months for the shows to all be edited, cut, you know, color corrected, whatever else, and come out. So because of that, no, I think we actually have the privilege of being able to tell a show wholly as we intended it. That's both from the creative end. They have written most of it by the time we start. Um, and, we have perf and we don't see any of it until it comes out, maybe a couple days earlier. But we, see, we don't see really a lot of it until it comes out. So our, and I find that incredibly satisfying as an actor, even though this is my first time doing a series, I find it satisfying because nothing from the outside really can affect or infect what is the story we set out to tell. We tell the story as Gingy planned it to tell, be told and as we as artists, well, how we wanted to express ourselves. So I guess maybe in that context, binge watching or how, how a show can be binged, like be it our show, House of Cards, you know, uh, Master of None, whatever the show is, you know, it is, it does change the template a little bit in that way, but I like it. Mm. And as I'm sure, as everyone here will agree, um, the show is so popular and loved. Um, where can it go next? Do, mm. Does Orange is the New Black need to do something different or should it continue doing the same thing? You want me fired. No. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think it's already proven itself to be a bit of a shape shifter. I mean, just by the very fact that it's shifted categories. Um, I think even in 
even if you like micro it, from within a, within a single season, you can watch, you know, say episode um, three of season two, and experience an entirely different color and mood from episode nine of the same season. I think that's what's been amazing about what Genji has done, is doing. Excuse me, she's only interested in writing and telling great stories, not even good stories, great stories. And isn't, isn't really hung up on conforming to anything. She thinks wildly, she is genuinely a genius. I, you guys should like literally try to have her. She is a true genius. I love her so much, she is. And one of the smart, easily one of the smartest women I've ever met in my entire life. Um, she is, she thinks outside the box. And I think that will continue with our show. I think we can even see it displayed, even the, the way the show, you know, the characters that are reflected on our show, the, the type of actors that we see on our show is already an example of how we're not really subscribing to any sort of tradition of television making. Uh, final couple of questions from me before opening it out to the audience. Um, so I'm asked two questions that are very similar, but very different. Okay. Uh, wh <laughs> what do you think will happen with Suzanne in season four? Now I'm sure you're trying to get me fired. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I know, we've already shot it. So <laughs> I I'm trying know. to talk in anti-spoiler language. Yeah. You know what? I'll tell you what. I'll t okay, I can tell you this much about season four. I just saw three people lean forward. Um, I can tell you. I can tell you this much. The show, <clears throat> this season, is definitely um, tackling the issues of race in a stronger and louder way. It is absolutely tackling um, corruption within the prison system and the penal system, um, and how um, those systemic bridges that have been built affect people both within and beyond just the walls of Litchfield. I can tell you that much. I think, and I think that's what, um, again, sort of circling back to your previous question, I think that in itself uh, tells you what boundaries Jinji does not play by. And that's really exciting. And within that description, somewhere Suzanne lies. <laughs> uh, and and um, you just touched upon it there when you say it, tackling the issues of uh, race kind of within the, the, the content of the show. Yeah. Um, it, one of the reasons for the show's success, I think it's fair to say, is the diversity of the ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sure. do you, is that something that attracted you to it in the first place, or something that you, as an ensemble cast, are aware of, that is so diverse in terms of race, sexual orientation, etc.? Mm. Great question. I will say this. When I read, because I originally read the pilot, when I read the pilot, I don't imagine when I'm reading scripts any specific face when I'm reading them. And it was to my excitement when I got there that there was such a wide array of color from race to size to age to gender to um, uh, sexual orientation displayed on our show. Because I would, and, and you also have to remember at that time, our show came out 20, 13, July, 20, 20, July 12th, 2013, I'll remember that forever. And um, at that time, which doesn't feel that long ago, when you really start to think back to that, it was a very scarce, well, you know, diverse landscape. You know, we had our scandals, we had Grey's Anatomy was really maybe, at least in the United States, I'm not really as well versed, forgive me, with UK television. But on, in the United States, we had Scandal, we had Grey's Anatomy, and that was pretty much about it. Um, so when I came to a workplace where not only did I see such a beautiful cross-section, but I saw that representation in, num in multiples. So it wasn't 
ah black person and ah Latino and ah gay person. You know, it was a show where we have seven Latinas on a show, the same show where we have six white women on the same show where we have seven black women on the same show where we have two Asians on the same show where we have a transgender actor with the same show where we have, a, you know, a self-declared um, butch <laughs> lesbian on our show. You know what I mean? This is the world that we live in. And from that moment, I became excited. And final question, this is one that's similar for yes. opening it up. Whether it's in season four or season 20, okay. fingers crossed. 20. Um, <laughs> what, what would you like to see happen with Suzanne? I've said it from the beginning. My only wish for Suzanne is for her to find a love equal to equal and deserving of her love. I think she has love to give. And I think if she can find somebody who can understand it and see her for who she is, or how I see her at least, I would love if that story ended happily ever after. Seems like a good place to open up to the floor. Okay. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand high in the air and a microphone will come round to you. If we can, please go to, uh, in the red top, two rows in the back there. Thank you so much for being here. My name's Deborah Owen. Um, I'm currently an MBA student here at Oxford. And I guess my question is just to touch a little bit on the race topic. So most of us have heard about the hashtag Ox, um, Oscar so white and so many things going on um, in the industry um, regarding race. And so my question to you really is, what do you think are the solutions going forward? How can we see more women and men of color, not just black, not just Latina, but Asian as well, um, represented in mainstream television and mainstream movies and so forth? And then maybe you could just comment on the whole um, Nina Simone saga with the colorism. Maybe if somebody else isn't going to ask that question. Okay. But yeah, thank you so much. Well, here's my question. I think the, the I'll, I'll touch on the first piece of it. Um, I think that <clears throat> the conversation starts, it, that conversation is a conversation that needs to be peddled and stepped back to months prior, right? You can't um, necessarily look at the Oscars in the sense that of the nominations if there are no, there's not the body of work to be nominated. So the real question I think, well firstly I always, my first thing is really actually, I would love to see that pose, that question eventually posed to the people who have the charge and the agency to change it. Um, secondly, um, just going back, I think that the real question I think we should be asking ourselves is about production. You know, it's not so much a really a conversation of who has not been nominated, though that is a just conversation and question, but I would be even more interested in the conversation about the level of work being produced by people who would like to be included in the conversation when we get to the Oscars, right? Um, that includes Asians, that includes blacks, that includes whites, that includes Latinos, that includes uh, Native Americans, that includes LGBTQ, that, in that includes age. There is a large population of people who are not a part of the conversation. And I think we really need to start asking ourselves, why is that? And I said it before and I say it again, I think until we're really ready to have that honest conversation about the beginnings of production and why people are perhaps overlooked or not feeling seen, I think only then are we going to really get to an honest and truthful answer, but that requires us having that honest conversation. Two, um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know the particulars, if I'm being really honest, with the making of that movie, so I don't feel qualified to answer. And I also haven't seen it. Um, so I don't feel qualified to see, I haven't seen it. None of us have. Um, so I don't feel qualified to speak on that 
subject uh, as much. I know that I am a fan of Nina Simone's work. I know that I love the Netflix original doc, um, What Happened Miss Simone, and I think they did a wonderful job in telling that story, um, representing her well. I hope the same is true for this. I don't wish anyone any ill anywhere, you know? Um, and I don't think, um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. I haven't seen it. I'll probably have a stronger answer once I have. Oh, can I just also say one thing more? Um, this is what I also wanted to say. If uh, an organization that we can, as an entire, if we're all people who watch movies and television, support and are truly interested in seeing more um, work that supports women and that is entirely inclusive, um, Ava DuVernay has started a production distribution company, Array, you can follow them on Twitter, Array Now, and they are constantly helping to get films, beautiful, beautiful films, female directors, female writers, uh, people of color, everything um, out into the world and making them a part of the conversation. Very, very, very useful outlet. Thank you. Uh, we had the question on the end here. So I'm going to go really niche. Um, are you on the Hamilton, the musical hype? Have you seen it? And if you have, what do you think it's going to change about the theatre industry in America? I've seen it twice. I saw it. Yes. Yeah, have you seen it? No, but I want to. Oh, you have, the, you have the soundtrack, right? You're like, how does a bastard? Like, everything it starts, it's so good. If you don't have it, get it. It's on Spotify. You're welcome. Um, so like, um, I've seen it twice. I think that should speak enough about how I feel about it. Uh, I have friends in the show who I'm so glad to see being given their moment in the sun to really showcase what it is that they do brilliantly well. Um, I think the show is fantastic. It's great. It's a great show. It really, really is excellent. I can't wait for you to see it when the tickets have stopped being sold out in 2042. Um, I think that um, I, my hope is always this, you know, in answer to the second part of your question, much like Orange, much like Hamilton, my wish is that this subject that we're attacking seems like it's a global conversation that's happening with regards to inclusion. My hope is that it is a style and not a trend, you know? Um, a crisp white button down will always be in style. A Chanel suit will always be in style. Birkenstocks are a trend. Do you know what I mean? Like, some years we love them, some years we don't. Right? Like, like, do you understand? And I would love that the way that we're trying to bring more people into the conversation remains a style and not a hot topic for the moment. And it's exciting to see things like Hamilton happening, and I hope that that continues. Thank you for your question. If, uh, unsurprisingly, we've got lots of questions. If we could please come uh, down here, to two from the end here. No shade to anybody wearing Birkenstock. <laughs> Um, one of the things I've always loved about the show is the humanity, and especially as a New Yorker, you look around and you see so many moments, and you see how quickly you go from very human and normal to in prison, and it's frankly scary to me. Mm. Uh, so as an American who finds our justice system totally unjust, mm -hmm. I'm curious what you see your role is, what you see the show's role is in actually pushing a conversation about restorative criminal justice in the U.S.? Okay. Firstly, big ups to New York. I live in New York as well. Um, secondly, I think what Genji, I think the brilliance of what Genji has done is she's seen, I don't know if it started from the show or if it was something that she tapped into, that this was something very real and just, just under the surface of our culture, our country, particularly in the United States, when we were seeing, you know, conversations about solitary confinement and it's, uh, this, the effects that that, that can have, uh, lifelong effects that that can have on 
incarcerated people if they're kept beyond 23 hours, you know, and you have cases of inmates who've been kept for in a solitary confinement for over 23 days, so we only know what, is it a system that's designed to rehabilitate or to do further harm, right? And I think what Genji does by broaching those subjects, I think what wound up happening is people started to think of these people like people. And that is all, re I think that's where change begins, isn't it, right? Whether it's the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, um, whether it's the abolition of slavery of the 1800s, whether it's the um, freedom of, uh, the, the, the emancipation of uh, Jews in Holocaust camps, whether it's bring back our girls in Boko Haram. When you start to think of a person like a person, it's harder for you to commit trials and injustices against those people. And I think Genji did the very brave work of introducing a lot of us to these characters in ways that all of us could identify. I think we came in with this idea of only being able to identify with the lead character. The notion was there, oh, I'm gonna watch this person have an experience comparable to what would probably be my experience were I to be caught in this really unfortunate predicament. And what wound up happening is people actually started connecting with many people, more people than I think they thought or imagined would happen. And so then you start thinking, oh, I am, I, it's a banana peel. And, and I think she also did the brilliant thing of making the crime, it's a minimum security prison. So you could relate to it. You know, these are minor infractions that got these people here. So it wasn't these dramatic, you know, crimes that were committed. This, this, these were good people, some of them, who just made a mistake. And I think through that, that's where the real work happens. I think that's where the activism happens. I think she's done a really brilliant job of taking the platform and injecting facts into it. Everything you hear on the show, by the way, anything you've ever looked at and been like, is that true, is actually a research fact. Those are all 100% currently happening within the walls of our penal system. And I think that's where her bravery and her activism comes and shines through most strongly. Because it makes us, it's made us now as an entire human family rethink what we're doing when it comes to incarceration. Thank you for your question. Look for another question now, please. Can we come down to the front here? Um, I was wondering if you could play any other character on the show, who would you play? That is an impossible question. I have been asked that question before. Either who is your favorite character? You know, it, it really is impossible because Again, and I'm not even trying to be you know, dodgy with this answer, I think what Genji has done is she's really created a world where we're not watching 10 versions of, I mean, 10 people play one, ver, you know, one person, you know, divided up. We're watching so many different characters and so many different reflections of women and womanhood that's exciting to me. You know, what I love about Gloria is not the same about, of what I love about Red. You know, so how can I even compare the two? What I love about Pousset is entirely different, you know, than what I love about uh, Sophia. You know, the, it's, it's impossible to say what I love about V is entirely, you know, is not, it's, I can't compare her to, you know, Piper. They're, they're, they're just so different. Um, and I love watching all of them. Plus, they're all my friends. So that makes it really hard. Really, really hard. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, if we go just behind you, then. Hello, my name is Yemi. Um, Yemi, OK. I have two questions. Um, one, I wanted to ask you about how you, or what your opinions were on the backlash the Wiz got. Um, about it being an all-black cast. Mm. And the second question was, um, if you could choose between Ghanaian and Nigerian jollof rice, what would you if choose? If I could choose between Ghanaian or and Nigerian jollof rice, <laughs> what would it be? You want a war. He wants me fired and you want a war. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, <laughs> um, okay, the first and more pressing question, clearly Nigerian jollof rice. Um, <laughs> so, I like Nigerian jollof rice. That didn't get around, yes. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a, yes. And a side of egusi, I'll be good. Um, I think that, um, with pounded yam, I think that um, with the whiz, the doing of the whiz, you asked about the backlash. You know, I don't know how strong that was here, or, or I did not experience anything but love and appreciation for it having been put on television. And um, as far as the black backlash is concerned, I mean, this is a piece that is some, um, I think what we were really looking at is maybe an opportunity to educate people on some very basic facts. Number one, The Wiz is 40 years old. It wasn't a piece that was written this past year. It has been performed on Broadway, and by the way, also was the uh, Tony winner for Best Musical of that year. Um, this is not a new body of work when we're talking about the musical theater catalog. Um, it's been long standing, long respected, long appreciated. So that's one with regards to, that's an education point I would give. Second, I think, and most obvious, is that um, I don't think it was trying to take anything away from anybody. I think it was noting an absence of inclusion in a previous iteration and was doing nothing other than trying to be a retelling. And I don't see anything wrong with that. I think it was done well. I think the score is brilliant. I think its ambition is lovely. And I think at the end of the day, which was really exciting and made me happy, um, so many people, regardless of race, regardless of whether they knew the original or not, sat down with their families, tuned in on that December 4th, and watched it and saw themselves in it. Saw that this was an experience that they could also participate in. And I think really right now we're in a time where people are realizing that some of these dividing lines we've drafted, and maybe not even we have drafted, but um, those who have come before us have drafted, we're realizing that the, some of those lines are quite silly, you know, that we actually are, have more in common than we thought we did. That watching The Wiz is not for them or for me or for, it's actually for everyone. And that made me the most proud. Thank you for your questions. We've got time for a couple more questions now. Um, if we could please go to the question over here. Hello. First of all, congratulations on your West End debut. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I was reading an interview that you did um, at the gala performance last week, and you talked about your character Solange and how she has this smirk about her mm. that's written into the script, and that you enjoy being able to explore, you know, what's behind that. And I think the word that was used was sadomasochism. <laughs> um, that was kind of in play with that. So. That got me curious and wondering, that as far as you know, these more intricate characters like Solange or Suzanne, how do you yourself, as the artist, go about the creative process of building those characters and bringing them in more deeply, whereas it's not just the surface level of Solange is a, sadom is a sadomasochist mm -hmm. or Suzanne is crazy eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, great question. I think that with Firstly, part of my process starts with, I can't move on or dig deeper until I have a vision. In the case of Suzanne, once I had that stage description, I immediately got this flash in my head of a woman with like a pacifier and a sledgehammer in her hand. Like, innocent like a child, but children aren't scary. Like, that's what the picture drew to me. And then I had some level of inspiration out of that that I described earlier. Solange was that smirk. I was just, you know if you see somebody smirking? Because it's very different to smirk than to either give nothing, like stone face, or to be smile, to smile knowingly is to smirk. And, you, and it, there's, an, there's a level of condescension. There's a level of 
ego to be that bold, right? And there's a level of, um, what would be the other word I would use? Satisfaction, I don't know what, that's what that gesture was giving me. A satisfaction, a level of satisfaction. And so when I had that picture in my mind, this woman who has the audacity to smirk in front of her mistress. So she's not afraid, of, she's not afraid. That's number one. She's now no longer, she's, she is fearless on some level, which then accounts for why she's able to take this act. Um, for anybody who's unfamiliar with the play, it's a story about two uh, maids who plot to kill their mistress. And as the story and the plan goes on, it very quickly unravels. And you can come and see it to see what the rest of the end is, um, if you don't know it. But that's where I sort of begin the groundwork for myself. And I try to layer that then into the text itself and see when she's, when that's a little bit more underneath and when that's coming out a bit more. When is she at her boldest? When is she at her, you know, her weakest? And that sort of starts to build the different layers for me in how to get inside of these people um, for, you know, even Galinda, I kept meditating on this word, believe. And, you know, she says that so many times in that number, believe in yourself. And this image of a sort of, of, a, of a queen, I, you know, and this idea of this word queen and witch sort of being <laughs> seemingly interchangeable in this world, you know. Um, Somewhat, because I mean, we don't use the word witch in a positive context, but yet she is a good witch. It almost sounded like oxymoronic to me. Um, I think that's where I sort of start to build things and kind of let it bleed through from there. Um, then for me, very important is the words and a real ownership of the text and the language, because I don't believe, for me at least, it's very challenging for me to feel my freest if I don't know what I'm saying and I have to know it in every corner of my being, all the way down to my pinky toes, to the top hair on my head. And when I do, then I feel like the experience of play and excitement, and it feels like things start cooking and stirring and live almost on their own, and then I don't even have to really think. I don't like to think when I'm acting. I like the thinking to happen beforehand, and then once we've started, I just want to live. Thank you for your question. Time for one final question. If you can please go to just there in the front row. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, I just wanted to ask, as um, a fellow Nigerian woman who's living in the diaspora, what you think the responsibility is for successful Nigerian women like yourself, or just successful Nigerians? Um, what do you think people like yourself should be doing to try to uplift our community as a whole? I think firstly, thank you for your question, great question. I think firstly, we, just by existing in our best selves, I don't know if it's true for you, but I mean, as I said in the beginning, so much was done for me to be here having this moment right now. And that is a gift that I do not take for granted. Um, I think anybody who makes any kind of sacrifice, be it time, be it energy, be it financial, be it their own dreams. Um, I understand that my passage has already been paid for. And so I think by hopefully living up to my highest potential, I'm doing my part. Um, I think also there, you know, I'm proudly Nigerian. <laughs> I am very proudly Nigerian, and I have no problem saying so over and over again. I am proudly Nigerian. <laughs> and so um, I think that those messages, it seems, and I'm very grateful to the country, um, that those messages keep getting relayed back home. And um, I hope I'm making us proud. I pray that I'm doing the work that might maybe one day make it easier, safer, 
nicer for someone else to come behind me. And I think that's the good work we can all be doing, right, in our lives. If we're really trying to pave the way so that the person coming behind us doesn't have to walk with shoes, maybe they can walk barefoot. Um, I think that's the thing that I'm trying to do. Thank you very much for your question. I'm afraid that is all we have time for today, but thank you very much to everyone who asked a question. And most of all, thank you very much, Uzo, for coming. It's an absolute pleasure to, to host you here. If you will please remain seated while Uzo leaves the chamber. Thank you very much once again. Uzo Duro.